Oh, well, thank you, Hank, for the introduction. Um, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, and thank you again for joining us today um, in our Beyond the Scope CMOS uh, discussion series. Um, oops, sorry. No. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, magnetic imaging using the transmission electron microscope. So there is, during this presentation, I will um, introduce some of the TM and STM-based magnetic imaging techniques, discuss their advantage um, and limitations, and present some of their applications. Uh, this will be a short talk, um, so ask a lot of questions. Uh, there is a Q&A uh, button below where you can add um, your questions, uh, and I will try to answer them at the end of the presentation. If you have any uh, technical uh, difficulties, uh, contact us uh, using the chat uh, function. So um, here, there is some of the current resources at CIMA, so you can uh, schedule a one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultation with the instrumentation managers, um, contacting them directly or sending an email uh, to simas.osu.edu. If you have any question or consultation that is not answered here about um, magnetic imaging using the TM or related with this talk, uh, please you can send me an email to my email address that I have added in this um, slide. Um, well, as it is uh, showing this slide, at CMOS we have different uh, electron microscope and also some other uh, X-ray uh, technical um, analytical techniques. Um, today's talk uh, will be focused in the um, aberration corrected microscopes, so the Titan image corrected and the Themis Z prof corrected. Both microscopes um, are equipped with Lorentz lens um, and an annular uh, segmented detector allowing to perform uh, Lorentz TM and differential phase uh, contrast in a stem. Um, usually in Lorentz TM mode, um, the special resolution is reduced um, compared with the high resolution TM. Um, luckily, in our uh, Titan system, um, the Lorentz lens is incorporated in the image corrector, uh, and that increased the special resolution in Lorentz mode to one, around one nanometer. So currently, all the magnetic imaging work is performed mostly in the Titan, uh, but we are planning to start using the TMS for magnetic imaging really soon. So a little bit about me, um, um, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm originally from um, Manresa, a town um, that is located in the center of Catalonia. Um, I obtained my bachelor's and master's degree in geology uh, at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And during my PhD, um, I focused my research interest on material science. Um, my research uh, was focused on characterizing the interphase and the associated strain defects in thin films of periscope type oxides uh, using the transmission electron microscope. Um, after um, I obtained my PhD on 2017, um, I joined the CMOS team as a research associate where I have been working mostly um, doing magnetic imaging using the aberration corrected uh, TNs. So, well, why we want to perform magnetic imaging? So we usually use magnetic imaging to study the properties of magnetic materials, which are really common in the modern electronics. Um, so for example, you can find them in the, in your, the computer memories. Um, Many applicable magnetic properties of these materials depend critically on the microstructure and the composition of the material, but also um, on the local magnetic structures. And for example, if they have like magnetic domains or they have a spin textures. So then magnetic imaging allow us to study magnetic properties locally and provide a direct visualization of the magnetic domains um, and spin textures. In fact, the TM offers the ability to perform magnetic imaging um, at higher spatial resolution. Um, this offer uh, has made magnetic imaging in the electron microscope a popular technique for decades. In fact, um, it was one of the earliest uh, techniques used for the analysis and the imaging of magnetic domain structures. In addition, uh, because of the large number of interactions that take place uh, when an electron hits the thinnest specimen, we can obtain uh, compositional, electronical, and structural information 
from the same region of the sample, and that allow us to correlate the magnetic properties and the local magnetic properties with the microstructure and composition of the materials. So uh, before that, I present the basics of the TM, uh, the magnetic imaging in the TM, I would like to talk about instrument um, requirements, especially because in the TM, independently if the, we are in conventional TM mode or STEM mode, the specimen typically sits in the middle of the objective, uh, objective lens field. And the challenge here is that um, we are studying magnetic specimens and the objective lens field uh, is enormous, like around uh, two tesla, that depending on the microscope. So with that, it's uh, high enough that can saturate most of the magnetic specimens and it can eradicate or severely destroy uh, most of the magnetic structure or spin tectus that we want to study. Then a number of strategies has been developed to overcome this problem. Um, one of these strategies is uh, switching off uh, the objective lens. Uh, the trouble is the, that lens uh, is the responsible for the magnification um, of the microscope. So some uh, microscopes have been able, uh, have available a mode uh, called Lorentz uh, TM in which we can, um, we can reduce the objective field uh, to zero or near zero, and also we can change it if we want to perform some uh, magnetism, magnetism uh, studies. Um, this Lorentz TM imaging mode is typically made possible uh, by the addition of a secondary lens, um, well, with a specimen, which are called uh, Lorentz lens, uh, and they keep the high magnification of the microscope. However, as I said before, um, the resolution suffers when we compare with the um, high resolution TM instrument. And as I tell, the advantage here is that in our case, since the Lorentz lens are in the corrector, so we can get a, a, a special resolution of one nanometer uh, when we are in Lorentz TM mode. So now uh, let's focus on the principles of magnetic imaging using the TM or what is called Lorentz microscopy. Um, in the TM, we have the electron beam that interacts with the sample. Um, if the electrons are considered particles, when they pass between and around um, a sample with an electrostatic field and, uh, or an in-plane magnetic field, they experience a Lorentz force. So these Lorentz force acts uh, normal to the travel direction of the electron, resulting in a deflection of the electron beam. So then the, the resulting deflection angle is uh, linked with the in-plane magnetization of the sample where the electrons have passed. Um, so if the sample has an out-of-plane uh, magnetic component, that cannot be detected with this technique because the out-of-plane component doesn't affect the electron propagation. So um, this deflection of the electrons can be used uh, to image the magnetic structure of the material. And we could that by different ways. So one is recording the focus images, that that would is uh, called, and it's done with the personal mode or the focus mode. Another way is by selecting um, one of these electrons that has been deflected in a specific direction using either an aperture, um, like it's done for in focal out mode, or by, um, or by using a, a, um, segmented, a, a segmented detector or a pixelated detector to perform a differential phase uh, contrast imaging in a scanning TM. So here, basically, I will focus um, in these uh, two techniques. One is the Fresno mode or the focus mode. That is the, where my talk will be mainly focused. And then I will talk also and make basically a refresh of the differential phase uh, contours that uh, Robert introduced several weeks ago. So then if we start with the Lorentz TM in Fresno mode or the focus mode, so the way that we observe the magnetic contours um, is the following. So if we have consider, if we consider a sample uh, that has different magnetized domains, um, when the parallel electron beam uh, pass through the magnetic uh, domain region, um, as I said before, um, the Lorentz force leads to the deflection of the electrons. Uh, then the deflecting electrons, when we look um, in the final image plane and we are in focus, um, there is no magnetic contrast, so they are focused there. But however, if um, we leave the overfocus condition, in the overfocus condition, the electron deflection induces a decrease or an increase of the intensity contrast, 
because the electrons are uh, deflected away or through the domain wall, making this so in some regions they converge and in other regions they, they diverge. And that results in uh, the appearance of uh, dark and bright contrast lines in the domain wall regions. So the similar contrast appears now if, if we look under the focus um, conditions, but the contrast in that case are reversed. So basically these images then um, are telling us where are the, what is the position of the domain walls, but not the magnetization from the inner domains. So here, for example, you can see uh, an example um, from, of Lorentzian images showing domain walls as a black and dark lines in the defocus images. Um, this is in a, um, ferro, in a compensate ferromagnet cobalt thorium sample. Um, so when we look the in-focus image, there is no contrast or the only contrast that we can see a little bit, it comes from the grains of the sample. But when we look this the focus image, we can see these uh, bright and uh, dark lines. If you look here, the focus that we are um, using is, a, is around 400 uh, microns, with this, which is a large defocus. This is one of the limitations of uh, this mode, is that the most of the time um, we need to use this relatively large defocus uh, to see the magnetic contrast. And um, the use of this large defocus may uh, result in um, significant image blurring uh, and limiting, and it can limit the spatial resolution too. So then this mode basically can be used to image uh, the magnetic domain walls. We can also use that mode to distinguish with what type of magnetic domain wall we have. But the interesting part, I think, uh, is that we can perform um, in situ experiments. Um, so we can use this uh, technique to, for example, um, if we have a magnetic sample and we know with different phases, uh, we can um, apply field and see how the different magnetic texture in the sample change depending on the magnetic field that you are applying. And we can do that not only with a magnetic field, we can also apply the current or uh, a study at different, the sample at different, the magnetic textures at different uh, temperatures. So the nice thing is that for the um, magnetic, if we want to apply a magnetic field, we can use the objective lens. So we don't need um, to have an extra holder uh, to perform that experiment, unless that we want to apply uh, an in-play uh, magnetic field. In fact, so in terms of um, in-situ holders uh, that we have available at CIMA, if we want to perform um, in-situ experiments, we have a biasing or heating holder and also a liquid uh, night vision holder that we can use. So then um, this option of performing in situ experiments um, in learning STM has been uh, widely used to study um, nanoscale topological magnetic configurations. Um, these configurations have received a huge attention uh, during the last um, years. Um, and that is because uh, we think that they have a really a potential application in the next generation of spintronics and memory devices. Um, these are um, one example of these topological configurations is uh, skirmions that with they are topological uh, protected so they behave like particles um, and then uh, they can form in some materials by the competition between uh, two different interactions one is the ferromagnetic exchange interaction which favors uh, parallel spins and the second one is the dmi interaction that can, um, favors the counting of the skins uh, of the spins. And these interactions arise in materials or systems that have an, a strong orbital coupling or a broken inversion symmetry. Um, then depending on the strength of these um, interactions, the spin textures like a spiral or the skirmions uh, that I show with, like in this image can be uh, stabilized over a range of magnetic field and temperature. So then one of the most um, studied skirmions host material has been this compound, um, has been based on this B20 component in components that have this B20 uh, type uh, crystal structure. These materials present a non central symmetric crystal structure, which breaks the inversion symmetry, uh, forming block type skirmions. Um, these type of uh, skirmions are like uh, vortex. Uh, with the spins canting um, and twisting away from the core of the skirmion. In Lorentz TM, uh, in the defocus image, the presence of this rotating uh, magnetic uh, 
fill uh, leads to this uh, a maximum intensity or a minimum intensity depending on um, the direction that the spins are rotating and also the focus. So here, for example, you can see an image from an skirmion lattice. So every of these dots corresponds to one of these um, minimum or maximum intensity uh, due to the, um, the deflection in produced for the skirmion. So now I would like to present one example of the in situ experiment performed in one of these uh, to study the stability of these um, skirmions or this magnetic texture. So here you can see a uh, Lorentz TM image uh, for the same material that I was presenting in the previous slide. Um, in this case, it's a thin field. Um, the transition temperature of this material is below room temperature. Uh, so that means that we need to pull down the sample in order to see the magnetic texture or the skirmions in this uh, system. So the thing, the thing that we did here, it was we first pulled down the sample. Um, and when we were at the right temperature, we start to see the magnetic contrast in the image. And this, um, usually when we don't have a applied field, any, when we have a zero field uh, in this sample, we see these lights, uh, la, uh, these lines that forms this bright and dark contrast that that corresponds to the helical phase. Um, and then now we can start applying um, field to the sample and see how the helical phase, that we have a transition from the helical phase to the skirmions, and then the sample gets saturated. So now then we can start to decrease the, the magnetic field and see how the skirmion phase comes back and then the helical phase. And with that, we can do an entire loop um, and look how the magnetic uh, spin textures that we have um, in this sample, when they are stable and in, uh, at what temperatures they are stable. So this allows us, for example, studying these materials with these, the phase diagrams in terms of temperature and we can um, cool down the sample, but we can also do some heating experiments. Well, in all these examples that I have presented, the Lorentz TM provides uh, a direct uh, qualitative uh, imaging. So that reveals the position where we have the an abrupt change of the implant, so uh, components. So it shows like the, the domain walls, basically. Um, now, if we want to have like a quantitative information, for example, know what is the in-plane, um, uh, the in-plane magnetization of the domains, for example, um, it's necessary that we recover the phase of the electron waves. So, and this can be achieved by means of the transport intensity equation. Um, and basically, the equations say that uh, we will be able to determine the phase information from the intensity measure measurements only. So the right um, hand side derivative in this equation uh, can be numerically formed um, from uh, through focus series of Lorentz um, of Lorentz images. So experimentally, that means that we have to take an image um, in focus and then two images over focus and under focus um, with the same magnitude uh, between them, and then we can align them which sometimes it's a little bit tricky because in Lorentz TM we have a little bit of like um, image, the image uh, will shift a little bit, sometimes the they will have a little bit of rotation and sometimes also the magnification can change slightly. Um, but then when we have the image uh, aligned, we can recover the phase. Then we can get this quantitative uh, magnetic phase, um, this quantitative, um, magnetic induction uh, maps that they show, as you can see here in colors, um, that they now they are telling me in what direction the in-planes moment, uh, moments are um, pointing. So for example, if we look this, if we've highlighted one of these uh, regions with the skirmion, so now we can see um, that the, these the skirmion, the spins are rotating uh, anti-clockwise. However, uh, this technique can suffer from um, artifacts resulting, for example, from the strong fringes in the edge between the sample, for example, and the vacuum, and the lack of knowledge. Yeah, we don't. There is a lack of knowledge in of the boundary conditions in the what is the effect of the boundary conditions in the phase. So um, there is some some 
um, part there for improvement then. So, and it's here when we see that when we can complement the, the uses of Lorenz's stem to avoid some of these um, artifacts. So, while well, Lorenz's stem is, uh, different, is done in a different field, it's a differential phase contrast method. Uh, so, several weeks ago, Rob introduced the DPC uh, during his talk about what I can do with the cemented detector. Um, and he nicely presented what can be done in terms of magnetic imaging using the a segmented detector, but also a big selected detector. So here I'm just gonna give a refresh. Um, the main advantage of uh, the Lorenz stem compared with Lorenz TM is that it's not necessary to defocus the probe. So we are in focus, it, this is a in focus technique. Um, and we don't need also to collect all these image series that then do the reconstruction in order to have these quantitative maps. Um, so in this case, so we, in a STEM mode, we are raster the rope across the specimen. So in the DPC, the deflection of the electron beam is measured for each point um, of the scan. And we can use a, a segmented detector to measure the deflection angle from the intensity in each of these uh, quadrants. And as the deflection uh, angle is linearly dependent on the um, integrated magnetic induction, um, we can obtain uh, direct quantitative images from, um, from the image from the, from the magnetic induction. Um, so we don't, we don't need to do the reconstruction of the phase there. So here you can, um, so here you can see, oh, Sorry, it's not. Um, yeah, no. So uh, you, here you can see uh, an example of the components of the magnetization that we can get um, using, a, in this case, a segmented detector. Um, in the case that they were presenting here, they, I am presenting here, um, they were. Um, they were using a solid A quadrant uh, segmented detector, but they were only using the. Um, so this eight pattern is divided in inner ring and outer ring. So they were using the outer ring to collect um, the data. So that means that's basically the same that using um, an annular segmented detector. That that's the one that we have um, in our in both microscopes in the Timus and in the Titan. So uh, then performing uh, DPC imaging with a annular detector means that you are not collecting the inner part of the transmitted disk. Um, so you are only collecting the basically the edge of your uh, transmitted disk, which uh, that suppress the high frequency, the high spatial frequency, and also unwanted differential contrast from the from non-magnetic origins. For example, if you have very thin grains, there it's going to they are going to be contributing in the images. So at the end, that results in a better uh, magnetic contrast signal. Um, so then, as you can see in the example that I presented here, we can get these two, um, from the two um, magnetic induction components, then we can reconstruct and know what is the direction of the magnetization and also what is the, mag um, the magnitude of the magnetization. And finally, we can get these um, in-plane induction maps, the, 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 the one that is in the F, that they are showing um, that they are the same thing um, that we, I was presenting before, um, from the Lorentz from the Lorentz TM images um, that were reconstructed reconstructed using the TEA. So, um, however, uh, there is um, uh, one of the inconvenient that I uh, I wanted to mention before that I keep going on is that uh, to do uh, Lorentz's uh, Lorentz's stem we need a relatively long large long time um, to record uh, the images since it's in the scanning mode it's uh, yeah we need more time to get uh, the images in general and that could be um, that could make like the recording of real time series of imaging if we do in situ experiments a little bit more challenging if the uh, variations that we are trying to look at they change quickly so and then just um, to finish um, with my talk, I just want to say that although uh, nanolar segmented can be clearly used for the DPC, the highest magnetic uh, image performance um, has been obtained with pixelated detectors. 
So we have one uh, at CMOS, um, currently installed in the Titan, but it's going to be in the Tina soon. Um, and in that case, they, um, so the thing that we do in that case is we collect, instead of collecting the outer part of um, our transmitted disk, we collect the entire um, Bragg field uh, disk, and then we can measure the, the, we can measure the center of mass from that. Um, and you can see here an example of like a, a domain wall from a permaloy sample. Um, so in the left side, you can see the data collected in a standard DPC. So you can see that there is something there that is changing, that, but it's not really clear. And if we look in the right side of our of the image, we can see that the contrast is really enhanced when we use um, the pixel data detector because that gives us more flexibility in orders in terms of processing the data. Um, also, this uh, one of the advantage of, of using a pixel data detector is that we should be able to um, to distinguish between magnetic contrast and grain contrast, and that's really interesting when we are studying what is the relationship, for example, between the magnetic uh, textures that you see and the grains that you have in your sample. So then um, to finish, yeah, I uh, would like to summarize some of the main points of these uh, two techniques that we are able uh, to perform um, here at CMOS. Um, basically say that in the case of the Lorentz TM mode, uh, we can use them. It's, it's more like in an easy uh, technique and we can use to perform um, imaging and see the magnetic domains. Um, it's really convenient to perform uh, real-time in situ experiments under magnetic field or current or also variable temperature. Um, one of the inconvenience is that we need this large defocus in order to see the contrast. Um, and then we can have some difficulties doing quantification um, the, due to the boundary, um, yeah, the boundaries in the sample or in the, in the edge of the sample or between um, grains in the sample. So in terms of the Lorentz stem um, differential phase contrast, say that one of the advantages is that it's an um, in-focus technique and the image contrast is quantitatively related with the magnetic induction. Um, so, and then um, the only, one of the inconvenience I would say is the longer acquisition time. So that can, yeah, that can make it, if we want to be, if we want to see reversal process, maybe we are not gonna be able to see this process. Um, we can record before and after, but not in between. Um, and then um, say that with the pixelated detector, uh, we can get the higher contrast uh, magnetic performance and also uh, the ability to separate magnetic and uh, grain contours. And with that, um, yeah, with that I finished. So here you can see the following. Um, speakers and present presentation titles from the following um, webinars uh, and sessions and, and with that um, I am I'm at the end if someone has any questions just uh, put that in the Q, Q, Q and A and I will try to answer them. <laughs>